Welcome to the Groton Public Library. We're so pleased to have you here this evening. And we're especially happy to uh, once again be partnering with Bank Square Books on a wonderful uh, literary evening. Um, so without further ado, I am going to uh, welcome Alyssa Englund, who takes care of uh, special events for the uh, bookstore, who's with us tonight. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm the event coordinator for Bank Square Books in Mystic and also the Savoy Bookshop and Cafe, which will be opening in Westerly next month. Um, we are still on target for that, so that's very exciting. Uh, thank you so much for coming out here tonight on this cold, dark night. Um, and we are, big thanks to Tony O'Dell for joining us. Um, she, if you guys don't know, uh, she's the best-selling author of six novels, including Backroads, which came out in 2000 and was featured as an Oprah's Book Club pick. And her new book is called Angels Rising. It came out on Tuesday, I believe. Um, and it tells the story of Dove, a tough, smart police chief who's investig investigating a girl's murder in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, reviewers have been really in love with this book already, and they've described Tawny as the absolute master of her craft and her writing as achingly beautiful, captivating, and insightful, which I think is just kind of an amazing combination. Um, Tawny is going to speak to you guys for a little bit, answer some questions, and then she'll be signing copies of her new book. Um, so everyone, please welcome Tawny O'Dell. Thanks, Alyssa. Well, I too would like to thank all of you coming out tonight. It is dark, but not cold, thank goodness. Um, this is my first a book event that I've ever done in New England, aside from Boston. I don't count Boston as New England. I'm from Pennsylvania. Boston stands in love. Um, so it's kind of exciting for me because I have been a published author for 15 years and um, have done tons of library events and bookstore events and whatnot. And so, like I said, this is my first time in New England. Uh, I don't know why you guys never invited me before, but it's, it's great to be here. Um, I'd just like to say that along with doing uh, a lot of these events, every once in a while you do get filmed. And it's always sprung on you. You'll be at somewhere and it will be like a local access channel and they'll come up to you and say, is it okay to film you? It never fails for me that whenever I'm on, I've got the great outfit, I'm looking good, I'm feeling good, and I'm, I, I give a great talk, there's never a camera. <laughs> whenever there's a camera, there's always something wrong. One time I had to do it, and I had a really bad cold. I wasn't even going to show up for the event. And was, so I'm being filmed, which goes out on the local access channel, was me like coughing and having to blow my nose the whole time. Another time I had a wardrobe malfunction. Um, and uh, so tonight I'm just going to tell you right up uh, front that uh, my personal life has been a, a little bit of shambles. I, I uh, recently moved to Maine of all places, only as far as Portland with my fiance. We broke up and now I am moving back to Pennsylvania. I'm in the process of doing this. And while I was, I just came from our home in Portland where I was packing things and I pulled a muscle in my neck. So I had to drive from Portland down here to Connecticut like this. <laughs> and so I have this weird tick. So while I'm doing this, and I'm glad we're filming this, <laughs> while I'm giving this talk, if every once in a while I go like this, okay? because my neck is really hurting. <laughs> All right, well, as you can probably tell, my, my talks are very informal. Um, I love my readers, um, not just because uh, they've enabled me to, to be a, a, a published writer and to continue writing and to help pay my mortgage, um, but just because they're so smart. I have the smartest readers in the world. And I'm not saying this just because they're my fans. If you ever read reviews that readers do on Goodreads or Amazon or anything where they review my books, just my average, my average readers, not professional reviewers, their reviews are always so fantastic. These are smart, articulate people, and I'm including you in that group. So I'm very, very happy to be here. And I'm also very, very happy to uh, support libraries in any way I can. Uh, I grew up in a, um, a small coal mining town in western Pennsylvania, which is the area that I write about. And uh, going to the library was one of the biggest thrills for me. Uh, I was a very, very avid reader, uh, and I always wanted to be a writer from the time I was, I was a little kid. Uh, I was writing short stories and fiction. As a matter of fact, my mom has saved everything I've ever written. Uh, she still has it all. She, she claims she's waiting for me to get to be even more famous so she can sell it all on eBay. <laughs> but uh, 
but uh, for now she's still holding on to it. Um, when I was in high school, I knew um, that I wanted to get out of my, the little town I grew up in. I wanted to go off to the big city and, uh, and uh, be a writer. And, uh, but at the same time, I, I wasn't sure that, that I could be a novelist, that I could make a living at that. So I, I had to have a day job. So I thought I would be a journalist. And um, to give you an idea of the kind of area where I grew up uh, in the 80s, when I graduated, uh, not a lot of kids were going to college, uh, and the ones that did were you know, staying locally in the area. And uh, I wanted to go to uh, Northwestern because they had a fantastic journalism school, Medill School of Journalism, one of the best in the country. And to show you the kind of atmosphere that I grew up in when I talked to my guidance counselor about where I wanted to go to college, he tried to talk me out of Northwestern because they had a really bad football team. And uh, I didn't listen to him. I went to Northwestern and got my degree there. Uh, started working in journalism. Really did not like journalism because I like to make up my stories. And uh, even though nowadays journalists seem to do that more than they used to, when I was in school that was really, really, really frowned upon. So I was very frustrated, but I, I continued to work in journalism. I got married right out of college. I had, uh, I had two children. I had them in my, uh, in my 20s. All this time, while I'm uh, starting to raise my kids and, and still working in, in, uh, in newspapers uh, as a reporter, I also was writing novels. And I wrote my very first novel when I was 22, right out of college. And I would go on to write five novels over 11 years and they were all rejected uh, time and time again by agents, by editors. Um, I have probably close to 200 rejection letters from all of those novels that I've saved. I, um, I kept them all in the same box. It, it became my rejection box. And I just put any form of rejection in this box. I have, box. I have um, letters uh, rejecting me for home equity loans. You know, I mean, anything <laughs> that was a bad went into this box. Um, what I was doing wrong was I was trying to write uh, what I thought other people wanted to read. I wasn't writing about what I knew about and what I cared about. I was writing about things that I thought would be marketable. And uh, that's a very big mistake for writers. Uh, the, one of the most common uh, adages about writing is write what you know. And it's very, very true. And I was, I was not doing that. And I would get feedback from, from editors and, and agents and whatnot who would say, wow, you're a talented writer. You're, you really know what you're doing. You obviously can tell a good story. There's just something that's, that's not right. Um, I actually got the rejection letter so much with the vague, just not right for us written at the bottom that I began to think that that would be my epitaph when I die. That'll be on my tombstone. Here lies Tani O'Dell, just not right for us. Um, fortunately, I decided after I kind of gave up on the idea of, of ever getting published, that's when I finally wrote Back Roads, which was my first novel. I decided to uh, set a book back home where I grew up in Coal Country, Pennsylvania, uh, about a 19-year-old boy who's, who's having to raise his, his younger sisters after his mother was sent to jail for um, shooting and killing his physically abusive father. And this book was something that just happened to me as I was home visiting my grandmother, walking down a back road. And uh, Harley was just this full-blown character that occurred to me. And I began writing that book, and I wrote it in a couple months. And at that point, um, the agent I had had had, had quit being an agent, uh, went out to Hollywood, was working um, for Imagine Productions, and uh, she put me in touch with another agent. I was very, very uh, down on myself and my writing at that point. I never, ever thought that I was ever going to get published at this point. I was just basically writing for myself and for my dad, who's my biggest fan and who always wanted to read my books. Um, what happened with Back Roads, again, talking about writing what you know, I think that gives your work a sort of intangible magic that isn't in, in other th kinds of, of plots and characters that you're, you're trying to force for a particular reason. Um, 
With Backroads, I went from waiting for my hundreds of rejection letters to having 14 publishing houses bid on the novel. Uh, I signed a two-book deal with uh, Viking Press, and uh, it, it was just my dreams were coming true. Yeah, my I was I was going to be published and by a big publishing company, and uh, the book came out in uh, January of 2000, and it was doing okay for a first novel, uh, for and for a literary novel. Uh, I mean, it wasn't on the bestseller list or burning up sales wise, but. I was getting really great reviews and doing events and doing interviews and whatnot. And uh, as I said, I, I had realized my dream to get my to get a novel published. So I was I was very happy. But my birthday came by on the end of February. It was a couple of days afterwards. That's how I always remember the day. And uh, I was in my kitchen making dinner. My kids were young. They were in the other room fighting. I could hear them yelling at each other. The TV's going. I'm making dinner. The phone rings. And I wasn't even going to answer it. That was back before caller ID. And uh, But something told me, oh, you know what? I am somebody now, OK? I, I have a published book. I, I have a publicist. I have an agent. I do I do interviews. People, people want to talk to me. I should answer the phone. So I answer the phone, and I say, hello, and this woman says, uh, could I speak to Tawny O'Dell? And I said, this is Tawny, and she said, hi, Tawny, this is Oprah Winfrey. <laughs> and um, I did what any of you would have done. I said, yeah, right, sure you are. And uh, she said, no, this is really Oprah. And um, I have this cousin, Kenny. He's, uh, we're the same age, and uh, we grew up together, and he's a real practical joker, and it play, plays all kinds of terrible jokes in the family. And uh, one of the terrible, terrible things he did to me is when he found out I was uh, writing novels and sending them around to agents and whatnot and editors, he would call up and pretend to be an editor at one of these publishing houses, and he could do, you know, fake voices and whatever, and would actually convince me they were going to publish one of my books before it would turn out to be Kenny. And there's nothing, there's nothing worse than you can do to a writer than something like that. And um, so all I could think of was Kenny had to be somehow behind this. So I actually said to Oprah, I said, I'm not an idiot. I know you're someone my cousin Kenny got to impersonate, Oprah Winfrey, and it's not even a good impression. <laughs> and. Uh, there was just the silence, and Oprah said, uh, I don't know your cousin Kenny, and this really is Oprah Winfrey. And I realized it was, and that was back in the heyday of her book club, and even though I knew about her book club, it never in a million years occurred to me that one of my books, could, that my book could be picked for it. So I just kind of spaced out, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't think at all, and so she starts like, shooting all these questions at me about the book, you know, asking me all these details. And she says, you know, what's the symbolism behind the kitten? I said, kitten? What kitten? There's a kitten in the book? And she says, when did the mom know for sure? And I'm like, know what for sure? And she says, is this really the author? I said, yes, 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 it really is. And she says, well, girl, you better reread that book because you're going to be on our show and uh, you're going to have to talk about the book and it's going to be a book club. Um, and uh, I was on the show. It was a great, great experience. Oprah was fantastic. Being on her show was amazing. Um, you know, being uh, an Oprah pick is, is a kind of a mixed blessing. It's fantastic for your career um, to give you an idea of the power of Oprah. Um, you weren't allowed to tell anybody that you were an Oprah pick until the day it got announced on her show. And if, if you did, uh, the urban legend was that they take back the Oprah pick. And supposedly the, there was this one author, nobody knows exactly who it was, that, that this happened to. And uh, everyone was terrified of that. And so the only people that can know, the only other person who gets to know is your editor because they have to reprint the books. Um, my, I had to actually wait an entire month. Normally the author only had to wait 10 days from the phone call, but she was going on hiatus and called me before she went on hiatus. So I had to wait a whole month before I could tell anybody, which was very difficult news to keep, keep to yourself. Uh, but what I did was I planned to come home. I was living in Chicago at the time, so I planned to come home with my uh, kids and my husband at the time and, and get my family all together in Pennsylvania. And 
had the TV on just when the announcement came on so they could be all excited. And that's exactly what I did. Everyone was all excited. It got announced on, on her show. And, and But um, again, to show you the power of Oprah, uh, prior to the announcement on Amazon, you know how they rank the sales of all books, Backroads was something like 13,000 something or whatever. After Oprah announced Backroads, we went on Amazon. It was immediately number one. Number one, that fast. Now, that is the power of Oprah. It's not the power of me <laughs> or any other author that she chooses. Obviously, that exposes you to a bunch of uh, readers that you would never, ever get exposed to. But it doesn't uh, sustain your career. And it, those readers don't necessarily follow you, uh, especially literary authors um, whose books are all different. They don't fit into a, a particular genre. So the bar was set very, very high after uh, after I was on Oprah's show. One of the best things that came out of that show, though, was um, Oprah put me back in touch with my ninth grade English teacher, Mr. Sinclair, who was the first person to ever tell me that I should be a writer, that I should be an author, particularly. Um, and uh, Oprah loves teachers. And when she heard me talking in an interview about how Mr. Sinclair is the first to tell me that, she arranged it so at the end of the show, when I was in the studio audience, she had Mr. Sinclair come out and surprise me. I hadn't seen him since high school, and it was great. He cried, and I cried, and Oprah cried. We all cried. And, uh, but after that, then, I remained in touch with him, and I still am in touch with him. And so after every, every book, when I get the, um, the advanced reading copies, I send one to him, and he grades it. <laughs> so it's, it's, still, it's fun. Um, so anyway, after that, I had to do a follow-up novel. And uh, my life, my personal life, was kind of in a bit of a shambles. I was going through uh, a divorce. My, my kids were still um, very young. And uh, I, I didn't know how I was going to follow up Backroads, uh, which had been this, this big bestseller. And it had so many fans and, and people that, that expected me to come back with some amazing novel and the the pressure was was so great and um, I had been living in Chicago for 14 years at that point and what I discovered as I started to write my second novel Cole Run was sometimes you have to go back home to remember what you know and that's what I did I, I uh, after my divorce I took my two kids and moved back to Pennsylvania once I was back there, I was able to finish my next book, Coal Run. Um, Coal Run deals with a theme that has I deal with in all my novels. It's not consciously, but it's there in all my novels. And I realized at the time it was because I was dealing with it in my own life. And that is dealing with the sometimes conflicting feelings we have about our roots, uh, how you can love a place and hate a place, <laughs> how you can, um, how you can uh, want to belong but not want to be there, um, how you can uh, envy a way of life but not want to live it. And um, I struggled with that my whole life. Um, I moved out of Pennsylvania. I moved back to Pennsylvania. I moved out of Pennsylvania. I moved back to Pennsylvania. Right, and now I just moved out of Pennsylvania and now I'm moving back to Pennsylvania. So I think I'm definitely someone whose roots keep pulling her back in, yet every time I leave, I tell myself, that's it, I'm, I'm never coming back. Um, but all my books, all my books deal with that, all my protagonists um, deal with it in different ways. After um, Cole Run, I went on to, to write two more novels. And uh, at, at that point, uh, to give you an idea, being a novelist is a very precarious profession, as with any of the arts. Uh, you, you, you never know. You, you can never know um, if, uh, how much money you're going to make book to book, uh, if you're even going to sell the next book, what your advance will be, what your sales will be. And uh, at that point, I was raising my kids on my own and had college on the horizon. and. Um, uh, my book sales were not what they used to be, and uh, I really went through a kind of um, low point where I was very, very depressed. I never, ever crossed my mind to quit writing, but I was doing things like thinking, 
I might like have to start working at a convenience store um, part time. Uh, you know, I couldn't think what I what else I could do because the only thing I'm good at, in my opinion, is writing fiction. <laughs> And who 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 writes? Um, you know what what else pays you to write fiction other than uh, you know writing novels? And it's funny because at, at, at events I would have people come up to me, and it's one of the things about being an author, um, because you want everyone to read your books, and you know that's you love libraries. People can come and read your books, and and you you love to hear people loaning your books out, and 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 it, you know it's all great. But I went through a period of time where. You know, I would have people come up to my events and they'd be, they'd say to me, oh, you know, oh my God, you're my favorite author. I love you. I'm so excited your latest book came out. I can't wait to have my cousin read it so she can loan it to me. And I would be, they're like, well, you know, you could buy it. <laughs> you could do that, you know. Um, fortunately, I came through that time and, uh, um, uh, wrote One of Us, which was my most recent book. And One of Us had a sort of a, a thriller element to it. And um, it got me thinking that I, I would like to write, uh, try my hand at writing a crime suspense novel, because I love to read them. I've always loved to read them. And uh, I thought, you know, I had this idea for a character. She's a, a, a police chief, the only female police chief in her county. Um, 50 years old, and she's very, very tough, very sort of plain spoken, um, but very devoted to her community, has a very uh, sweet, nurturing side, but she's also got a very, very dark past that she keeps hidden. And uh, she just sort of occurred to me, and I began to think about her and what was going on in her town, and came up with this murder of this teenage girl who ends up in, um, she's discovered in a, a fiery sinkhole in an abandoned coal town in, uh, in Western PA. One of the, we have these towns um, where mine fires have been burning underneath them and it gets to the surface and the ground becomes unstable and the towns have to be evacuated. And this is one of those towns and this is where this girl ends up. And uh, as the murder unfolds, she, she um, is, is a member of uh, the Truly family, which is sort of a uh, redneck dynasty of um, sort of petty criminals and, uh, and uh, a family that's always getting in trouble, and they're also very, very unorthodox people. And uh, Dove is drawn into that family. Dove Carnahan is the name of the, the character. And... Uh, and there's also her sister, who is a, uh, a dog trainer, uh, works for training dogs for canine units, and she lives alone. She's very, very reclusive and lives alone with uh, five German shepherds in her training compound. And um, there's also a, a state police detective who Dove works, works with and um, is a sometimes uh, boyfriend of hers. She also then has a, um, a long-lost brother show up with a uh, with his young son, her nephew that she never even knew existed, and the man who was in jail for many many years, who was responsible for murdering her mother when she was a teenager, uh, is released from jail and comes to her with a startling accusation and a very chilling threat. These are all the things that Dove is dealing with. I uh, had a great time writing her because. It's the first time uh, in three of my novels, the main characters were, were men, told in the first person. Uh, Sister Mine was the only one of my novels that was told by a female first person. This is the first time that I'm writing about um, a woman who's my age. And I just turned 50, and there was something about that age that made me become very reflective and really start reevaluating how I thought about life and my priorities. And, um, and I wanted to be able to, to have a character who I could uh, share some of that with that character. Um, so anyway, I'm going to read a little bit from the book. And this is the first time I'm reading from it. I'm just going to grab.
And I think I was going, oh, and I need glasses now, ever since I turned 15. <laughs> and that is one of Doug's quirks. She can never find the glasses because she took glasses. I can't get used to it. Oh. All right. This is, uh, as I said, this is the first time I'm reading from this book to anybody. So that's kind of fun. Let me see. Okay, I'm just going to read from, a, from the first chapter. Um, so Dove is out. She's been called out to this town of Campbell's Run, this uh, abandoned coal town, uh, where this girl has been found uh, by, by someone who was out walking his dog, and the dog found her. And so, yeah, so we'll just start here in the middle of the chapter. Uh, Nolan Greeley, the, uh, the, the state police officer, has just arrived that she, has, that she works with. Corporal Nolan Greeley comes walking toward me. He looks like the kind of big, solid, humorless trooper that makes a motorist's heart sink when he sees him in a side view mirror. He's actually a detective in the state police criminal investigations division and no longer wears a uniform, but he doesn't need to. From his iron gray crew cut and the slow, purposeful pace of his steps, there's no denying he's a cop. He stops in front of me and looks me up and down with a face set in stone and a pair of mirrored sunglasses hiding his eyes. Hello, chief, he greets me. You on your way to have tea with the queen? I'm in an iris blue skirt and blazer and a new pair of taupe patent leather pumps I just bought at Kohl's with a 30% off coupon. The blouse I'm wearing is a bright floral print in honor of the sunny summer day. I'm supposed to be at a chamber of commerce breakfast at the VFW, I tell him. His expression doesn't alter. I can't tell if he admires, pities, or envies me. I have to admit I was surprised you called me right away, he tells me. There was a time when we would have had to pry this case away from you. I've decided not to waste my time and energy fighting the inevitable, I reply. You mean me specifically, he asks, or the entire state police force? I give him a slight smile. You, Nolan, I joke, if you were a superhero, that would be your name, the inevitable. And your superpower would be always showing up, even when you're not wanted or needed. I'm always needed, he says, without smiling. Well, I'm not reluctant to ask for your help this time, I explain. I have a good bunch of guys working for me, but none of them are prepared to deal with this. It's that bad? Worst I've seen. I think she's a teenager. I reach down and slip off my shoes. I can't walk back there in heels, I explain, and I don't have a pair of practical shoes with me. Again, I can't tell if Nolan admires, pities, or envies me. We start walking toward the site. Nolan motions at the two crime scene techs that arrived with him. Blonsky and Singer, two of my rookie police officers, have come back after initially examining the body before they stumbled away and threw up. They are, they are rookies to police work and life in general. They're in their early 20s and both still live at home, although Blonsky recently made the bold move to an apartment above his mom's garage. I hired them about a year ago. The only dead body Singer's ever seen prior to this girl was his grandmother, who was dressed in her Sunday best, lying peacefully in her white satin-lined casket. Blonsky was first on the screen, scene at a traffic fatality a few months ago. It wasn't pretty, but it was nothing like this. Have you ever been here before, I asked Nolan? Once on a dare when I was a kid. We stopped next to a snarl of fallen barbed wire. You can't get over that in your bare feet, he says to me. I did it before. Without saying another word, he grabs me around the waist and swings me in the air over the wire. That was humiliating, I commence once I'm on the ground again. I would have done the same for a man, Nolan assures me, only I rarely run across one performing his duties without shoes. I ignore his dig. I've been in a male-dominated profession for my entire adult life. I've experienced every kind of alienation, sabotage, and harassment the Y chromosome has to offer. Most of it isn't sincere. It's simply expected. I save my disgust for the true misogynist. The mine fire that destroyed the town of Campbell's Run began several miles below ground more than 50 years ago before finally making its presence known on the surface 10 years later when a sinkhole opened up in a backyard, releasing a cloud of steam rife with the rotten egg stench of sulfur. The hole turned out to be 300 feet deep and the temperature inside it turned out to be almost twice that number. Soon afterward, a little girl's rabbit hutch was swallowed up, then a bird bath. 
One morning, the handlebars of a prized Harley were found park poking out of a 10-foot-long ragged slash in the owner's driveway. All of the town's residents were relocated, except for a few holdouts. Roads were torn down, houses were torn down, roads were barricaded, and warning signs went up. I stepped gingerly over the scorched ground, fully aware of the dangers beneath my feet, while Nolan stomps heavily behind me, daring it to give way. Where the fire burns hottest, more than a dozen smoldering gashes have opened up. Dead trees have broken loose from the weakened soil and fallen over. Their exposed roots remind me of the tangled legs of dried out spiders that Neely and I used to find in our attic. In one of these fiery holes in the ground, someone has stuffed a dead girl. Nolan and I stare down at her. The top portion of her body has been badly burned. Her eyes are open and staring in surprise out of a face that looks as if it's been slathered in barbecue sauce and overbaked until it's begun to crack and flake. Most of her hair is gone and the damage to her skull is obvious. I highly doubt she survived those blows. Hopefully they were inflicted before she was lit on fire. Nolan kneels down to get a closer look. I think whoever put her there thought she'd burn up and disappear, I go on. And when she didn't catch on fire, he doused her in some kind of accelerant. Then there's this. I gesture at a comforter, streaked in bloodstains and black burn marks we found in a bank of weeds. Chantilly pattern in corals and oranges with a turquoise medallion overlay. I'm pretty sure that's from the Jessica Simpson Sherbert Lace Collection. You can find it at Bed Bath & Beyond. Nolan looks up at me with his unreadable reflective eyes. I was shopping for some new bedding recently, I explain. I didn't get that, I further justify myself. It doesn't look like she was allowed to burn long. Maybe someone tried to put out the fire with the blanket. He doesn't say anything. My officers and I stand by while he continues to stare intently at the dead girl from behind the black depths of his glasses. Even eerier than the landscape is the absence of any noise. It's a perfect June day, and not a single bird is chirping, not a fly is buzzing. Dogs aren't barking and children aren't calling out to each other. No one is mowing a yard or playing a radio or wielding a power tool. How do you want to get her out of there, I asked Nolan. She's only a few feet down, but there's no way of knowing how fragile the earth is around her and how deep the chasm might be beneath her. There's also no way to know the extent of her burns and the resulting condition of her body. If we tried to pull her out, she might come apart. Nolan finally stands back up. One of us needs to get down there to help hoist her up, he says. We can tie a rope around whoever goes. I've got two troopers with me, but they're big guys. He sizes up Blonsky, who has a stocky, no-neck weightlifter's build, then Singer, who's tall and lanky, then me. Do you weigh more than him, he asks me. No, I reply sharply. You sure? He's skinny as a stick. He's 6'2 and a man. I weigh the least. I'll do it. You're wearing a skirt, Chief, Singer ventures, ventures hesitantly, and you don't have any shoes. Yeah, Blonsky chimes in. Shouldn't we wait for someone with the proper clothes and equipment who knows what they're doing? Who knows what they're doing, I repeat in a tone that puts an end to any further argument. I take off my jacket and slip a rope under my arms while the men hold the other end. I'm not worried for my safety, but I am worried about my blouse. I hate the fact that I've been caught off guard, unprepared to do my job. But in all fairness to me, this is not my job anymore. I have an office now with a comfortable chair and a, Ke and a Keurig. I'm a coordinator, a schedule maker, a form filer, a public relations maven, a handshaking figurehead. I'm the first female police chief, chief in the county. I cling to this knowledge in an effort to maintain some dignity as I descend into a muddy hole to retrieve a corpse. I try not to think about the girl or to look at her until I absolutely have to. The hole is hot and steamy, and I also try not to think about the earth around me falling away, exposing the leaping flames of hell a mile beneath my dangling feet. I wedge myself against one side and reach out to grab the body around its midsection. It looks as if the fire didn't spread below her hips. The sight of her young bare legs sticking out from a pair of cut-off shorts makes my throat tighten. Miraculously, one of her flip-flops is still on one of her feet. Her toenails are painted neon pink, and an anklet made of sparkly hearts glimmers in the black dirt. I gently pull her toward me, ignoring the sound, smell, and feel of seared flesh and bones, and try to imagine the girl she once was before her heart stopped beating and her soul fled. Did she like school? Did she have a lot of friends? What did she want to be when she grew up? None of us speak once we have her laid out on the ground. We stand around her in a protective circle and silently share our individual grief. T. 
Tears are acceptable in even the most hardened police officers in situations like this. They're all thinking of sisters or daughters. I'm the only one who sees myself. I'm the first to look up and away from the dead girl and this dead town to the lush green waves of rolling hills on the blue horizon, and I feel the familiar ache that always comes over me whenever I'm faced with ruined beauty. One by one, the men turn away too, consumed for a final moment by their private tortured thoughts before returning to the practice numbness that enables them to do their job, but unfortunately can't shield them from their dreams. Our sleep will be haunted tonight by those legs that even in death look like they could get up and run away from here. Thank you. Okay, now I'm doing some fine. Okay. Uh, so, does anybody have any questions? I'm always happy to answer questions. Sometimes I get some really funny ones. So, yeah. I wonder if you're going to continue uh, the story of Dove and, and future books. Yes, I am, actually. Uh, I'm well on the way to finishing the second one in the series called Losing Daylight, and I have an idea for the third. So not only am I writing a crime suspense novel for the first time, but it's going to be a series, uh, hopefully. Hopefully. Um, I mean, hopefully in the sense that people will receive it well. I'm writing the books regardless. But um, yeah, so yes, there will be another book coming out um, next year. So. Did I see somebody else back there? Yeah. I've come up, uh, come up with the uh, uh, premise of the story, and I was, how did you come up with the, the, uh, the way that, the way it was going to be laid out, the, you know, the officers finding the body, and then the, uh, where, where the body was found? You know, I, I write very free form. Like, I don't do outlines, I don't make notes, I don't plot out anything, which is just how I write. So basically, all of my books begin with a main character, with a protagonist. In this case, it's Dove, the police chief. And uh, the story just unfold as I go along. And uh, so, and, and I, it, this isn't like based on anything, you know, any crime in particular that I ever heard of. It's just, you know, it's just the stuff in my head. What happened is you picture in your mind exactly where the offices are. Oh, yeah, most definitely. Where, you're, where the body is. Yeah. Where the weapon was found, uh, if there was one. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I do picture, I see my books in my head, you know, like they're almost like you're watching a film. I mean, it's, they're very visual to me. You know, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is more about this. Mm -hmm. Are there more towns besides Centralia that, that are on fire? There are a couple others, but that's, that's the most dramatic uh, situation. I mean, th there's like hundreds of acres burning around Centralia. And uh, that's actually, my second novel, Coal Run, is based on a town like Centralia. Um, the whole novel is. And uh, that's sort of what I had in mind for this town as well. So it's a very, I first went to Centralia when I was in high school, and uh, it's, it's like a really, really spooky place. Yeah, it's very creepy. And as a, as, as a, as a, a young writer, someone, you know, was always thinking, I said to myself, even as a teenager, I said, I'm going to write about this someday in a book. Because it was just, it just strikes you as, it's, I mean, it's a ghost town, but not like the Wild West kind of ghost towns. I mean, what... Uh, what, what ruined the town and poisoned it came from underground and just this idea of like uh, uh, a town being on fire underneath and, and, it, and it is a ghost town and there's just like all these like crumbling foundations, the houses have all been bulldozed and it's um, and just left and nobody can live there. I mean it's, it's a poisoned area so um, yeah so there are a couple other ones but Centralia is by far the worst. Yay, Scranton! <laughs> oh, really? But I have memories in the 60s of my grandmother lived in Carbondale. Oh, yes, and yes. With the burning mines underneath, and, and just years of that went on. And the last time I went to back to visit, there was a shopping mall built on top of it. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, yeah, I, well, that's, yeah. I guess, I guess they must have, well, you hope. You hope that somebody made sure that that's a safe place now, or someday the mall will just fall into the, to into the earth. Uh, yeah, 
No, I know. It's, it's, I mean, it's not just in Pennsylvania. It's anywhere that there are coal mines, but um, there, there's definitely a lot of that in the state. Our porch separated from the house. Oh, really? One time, like, growing up, just because of the shifting of the mines underneath. Yeah. All Scranton's built. Right, yeah. I know, yeah. I just drove through Scranton just the other day. That's so. all you want to do is Yeah, I, I know. I, I know. No, I know. I just didn't go back. No, no offense to poor Scranton, but that's always what people yeah, always say about Scranton. You just want to drive through it, but, you know, it's not as bad as Altoona, really. I mean, if we're honest, it, it, Scranton's a little better. I hope this isn't going out to anybody who can see that in Altoona <laughs> or Scranton. So, anyway, yeah. So you don't actually have an outline, but when you begin a story, do you have some idea of where you want to go with it, like the ending? Yeah, I... Definitely, and I, I did. I did with this novel and with um, and with Losing Daylight, the the, the sequel, the next one, uh, because of the fact that it is a, a, a mystery. You know, it is there is a, a crime, and you have to get to the resolution of the crime. For the first time ever, I was actually you know like trying to do some notes and things so I could just keep in mind where the the. Uh, you know, the characters and who was a suspect and this and that, but even the actual crime just kind of un unrolls in my head as I'm writing. I actually had have this one scene, there's a, a really great interrogation scene, uh, the one between, I'll talk to Alyssa because I know she's read it, the one between Dove and Shauna, when all that stuff is revealed in the interrogation, where as I'm writing that scene, I had no idea of any of that information that was going to come out. And it was just sort of like I was like watching the scene unfold, even though I'm creating it in my head. And as it's happening, I'm writing it. And, and I'm like shocked by it. I'm like, you know, I'm like, oh my god, this is what's really going on. And that's how I've always written. Um, I, I can't really, I don't really plan ahead. That's always worked out for me, fortunately. Um, usually about halfway through the book, I get the ending. And then I know the ending, and then I can kind of guide it towards that ending. But yeah, it's really, I really don't have, have much of it planned out. And I don't know if that makes me a, a genius or, or an idiot. I don't know which it makes me. <laughs> but it, that's how I write, you know, so. personality, you find that, does it start to shift a little bit? Or do you, do, does it become what you kind of had in mind? Or does it grow? No, her, her personality, and I, I can say this of all the protagonists in, in all my novels, they, they definitely shift and evolve and grow as you're, as you're, as you're writing. Um, but the, the core of their, their personality stays the same. It, it's, it's, almost like I, I, it's almost like how when a reader is reading a book and you're, you're, you're getting to know the character, it, it's, it's like you, know, you meet a, a person in real life, and you find out a little bit about them the first time you meet them, then next time you run into them, you talk to them, you find out a little bit more. For me as a writer, that's how I am with my characters as well. When I start writing a book, I, I don't know everything about them. But by the end of the book, I do. And um, that's just sort of how they develop for me. And it, I, I like writing that way because it's, it's, always, it's always fresh for me. It's, when I sit down to write every day, I don't really know what's going to happen. I might have some idea where that where that chapter is going to go, but I'm open to the changes that can happen. So that's how I write. Yeah, I listen. How is it writing a sequel now that you know the characters so well and you're starting out at that place? You know, it's hard. I'll tell you what. I have I have such respect now for uh, for people who write series um, because to know like how much you want to put in that you've already revealed in the first you know, the other books because you want people, maybe the, the person who's reading the second novel hasn't read the first novel, so you have to explain some things, but you don't want to over explain things that were explained in the first novel in case the person who read the first novel is reading the second novel. It's, it's really uh, difficult. Um, but I think, I think it's something that, as I've been writing the second one, it's, it's started to come easier to me as to get along. At first, at first it's tough. But um, it, it definitely is... Um, a different uh, sort of uh, aspect of the art form in order to be able to do a series and to, to maintain it from book to book to book, but also to make each book be a standalone. It's a very difficult thing to do. And like I said, I, I have renewed respect for, for writers who do that, which I never really gave it much thought before I had to do it myself, but it is, it's difficult. Yeah. When you read a series, sometimes the same protagonist does 
and they become more complex. And it's kind of nice, actually. Oh, yeah. They become a little bit different. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, as a reader, that's what I want. So it's also what, what I try to do as a writer. So. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah. yeah. How did you come up with the name? Mm. Dove. <laughs> You know, I'm not even sure exactly why I came up with Dove, but then it's a, her mother, okay, her mother that was murder, who was murdered when Dove was a teenager, who is a very important aspect of the book, um, is quite a character. And sh she named, um, she was, she was uh, obsessed with being uh, clean. You'll find out why in the next book, not in Angels Burning. Um, just her her person, not not her house, not her house was filthy, not whatever. But she was she was uh, took like a couple baths a day. She only used Dove soap, and she named Dove after soap, basically. And then her second daughter Neely is named after um, the character Neely in Valley of the Dolls, because the novel had come out and was very popular when Neely was born, and it's the only novel uh, her their mother ever read. And then the, the brother, the younger brother, is named Champ after um, her favorite puppy when she was a kid. So she's, a very, she's kind of a very unusual woman, and, and the names that she picked for her kids are, all have a uh, special meaning behind them. That also, uh, as you get to know the characters, they, they have significance for each of the characters' personality as well. So, but that's, I, I really don't know, with, with names with my characters, they just sort of come to, like I was saying, like my characters just appear, the names sort of come with them. And uh, so I, I don't really, I can't really, there's not really any, um, you know, uh, story behind that. It's just the name, so, yeah. Is Tony O'Dell your real name, or was it his? <laughs> no, no, that's my real name, and it's also my maiden name. Um, I both, I've been married twice, and both times I kept my maiden name um, because I just preferred it. <laughs> And also because um, because uh, I wanted to be a writer. And when I was married, my first husband I married right, uh, I was still in college, uh, right out of college. And I hadn't been published yet as a novelist. But I had had short stories and, and uh, stories in newspapers, magazines, whatnot, uh, published under my maiden name. And so I wanted to keep my name because I knew that's what I wanted to write under. And uh, I'm very proud of my Irish heritage. And so I like to keep Odell. Um, so, yeah, so that is my... My real name. Anybody else? No? Yep. I know I, I have one to two books, books. I like to read a lot. But I get really attached to characters, mm -hmm. you know, in books. And that's when I know I love the book. Mm -hmm. When I really feel like, you know, these are a friend or a connection. Is there anybody in your books that you feel that way about? That you really felt a connection to? Or? Well, I felt that way with all my... All the, all the characters in all my books. Um, but I will say, depending on the type of book, like Back Roads, uh, my first novel, the one that was the Oprah pick and the bestseller, uh, it was, it's a very dark book. And when I finished writing that book, I was so relieved, really, to get those characters out of my head. Because it was almost, you were living every day with this family, uh, very dysfunctional family, with this, this very um, tragic, um, life uh, uh, swirling around them and um, so when I stopped having to think about Harley who is like a, my son you know I love I love him but when I got them out of my head I was so relieved it was really and as a matter of fact there, there was a follow-up show that Oprah did years down the road where she like did a compilation of authors talking about authors that had been on her book clubs talking about various aspects of the writing process. And, and one of the um, questions was, like, do you, uh, do you miss your characters when you're, when you're done writing the novel? Do you miss your characters? And, she, and I, think it was, I think it was Jane Hamilton who was talking about um, how, uh, yes, when you know, she misses them so much, and whenever she finishes a novel you know, and sends that manuscript off, you know, she, she's, she mourns them, she's sad. It's like, 
She's not going to see them anymore. It's like, you know, you graduate high school and you leave your friends behind. And then, and then that was followed up with me. And I was sitting there going, oh, I was so glad to get them out of my head. You know, it was like, it was like leaving an abusive relationship. It was like, you know, so. But I have to say that wasn't true of every book. I think it was my other novels that weren't so dark. You know, I, miss, I sort of miss the characters more. But by the time you're, at least for me, by the time you're done writing a novel, you have the next novel in your head. You're already thinking ahead, so you're, you've already got the next group of characters, so it's not really that you feel this loss because you've moved on to the next, the next characters. But, um, but I know like uh, all, my, all my novels, I always have uh, readers, fans, who are always like, oh, you should write a sequel, you should write a sequel, especially Backroads. I've had so many people you know, want a sequel to that novel. And, I don't have anything more to say about those characters. Um, it would be forced. But so this is the first time with this character, Dove, that I actually have like a whole, um, a whole lifetime of things I want to write about her. I've never had that happen before. So you know, I'm hoping that readers will feel the same way about her, that they want to keep, they want to keep reading about her. I think her life is interesting enough and complicated enough that, and I think she, she does, that's one of the things that, um, uh, my readers love about my books that I always hear feedback from them and reviewers say as well is that my characters seem like real people that you know. You know, these could be your neighbors. These are people and, and that's why they get so involved in, in their lives because they really feel like they, they, they know them. They know them and they can relate to them. So. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. All right. Then I'm going to stop and sign some books, hopefully. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.